is, is it relevant to know what you've been saved from in order to appreciate what you've been saved to? Yes, ma'am. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. If we understand what we've been saved from, then it helps us appreciate what we've been saved to. Because sometimes you can receive a gift, but if you don't understand the value of it, then you're not going to treasure it quite as much. Right. You know what I mean? Why would you I'm, not receive a gift? There's a lot of people that don't want it. There's a lot of people that don't want it. A lot of people don't want to give up self That's in order to receive grace. Um, and how many 12 year old kids would you give a thousand dollar coin collection to? Well, they would put it in the gumball machine. They wouldn't know the value yeah, of it. I, know. I, think, I believe that it's called mercy. Mercy and grace. Absolutely. In my opinion. Well, grace and mercy go together, okay? Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve, and grace is when you do get what you don't deserve. Did I say that right? No, you did not. You said you don't deserve either way. No. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve, okay? So you have ran a traffic light and the cop's gonna pull you over and he's gonna say you have, you ran a red light and I, I'm gonna give you a ticket, but instead today I'm gonna have mercy on you and I'm not gonna give you a ticket. We deserve a ticket because we ran the red light, but he's not giving us a ticket because he extended mercy. Grace is when you, um, do get what you don't deserve. So it's you've ran through that red light. Listen, you've ran through that red light. The cop pulls you over and he said, you know, you just ran through that red light. And you said, yes. He said, well, I was gonna write you a ticket, only today I'm not. I'm not gonna write you a ticket. I'm gonna extend mercy. But I'm also going to extend grace. So here's $100, go to the Cheesecake Factory and get you one of those little pieces of chocolate cake that Jeff wants. For $100. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at two or three cakes, maybe. Well, That's a hundred sack lunches in my mind's eye. But yes, it is. Really is. Yeah. yeah. My mind's eye. If you're paying for the name. Check this. What? My mind's eye. Um, I get to move into my apartment on the 8th. And I've been working for this for years. Yes. Is that grace or is that mercy? That's grace. Yes, we do. It seems good. Grace is like the present, okay? Like a present that you get. And mercy is like the fact that you didn't get hold into so jail when you were there. grace is the present and mercy is what? Mercy is, mercy, mer they're both presents, but grace is like the bow on the present. Mercy is the bow on the present? No, grace is. <laughs> We'll talk okay. about it later, okay. Miss Sabrina. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's important to understand that what we got saved from. I love your hat. Thanks. Yours too, and yours too. We're not, you know, we should have ball caps. We should have UBC ball caps. It is too hot in the summer to wear. Keep your hair from getting sunburned, though. Some, for some folks, that's more important. Folks that don't have hair up here. So. Um. I like your flip flops. Oh, thanks. My fuzzy flip flops. You can dye them purple. <laughs> um, because here's what I thought. Okay, growing up, I thought I'm not quite. I'm not as bad as these other kids, or I'm not as bad as the folks next door, or I'm not as bad. So I'm okay. I'm not that bad. But I was comparing myself to the people next door, the kids down the street or to other people that are in this avenue. That's not who we compare ourselves to. Who do we compare ourselves to? Jesus Christ, absolutely. Compared to the perfection of Jesus Christ, how do I look now? I look bad. You're precious. Well, I look bad back before Jesus, seriously. <laughs> Before Jesus came and transformed my life and saved me, I looked bad. I looked different. Think it's gonna rain? Yeah. It's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt. Yes. Y'all wanna go inside? Yes. Yeah. All right, let's go and we'll continue inside. In Ephesians, Paul is writing to the church there. And he's talking about, now he calls Gentiles, 
we got Jews and we got Gentiles. Jews are the Jesus people, and the Gentiles are people that are not. You either are Jewish or you're not. Anybody in here Jewish? Are you? Or, I mean, I've been grafted into it. But, um, so, for the most part, we're Gentiles, okay? But what he's referring to when he talks about Gentiles is he's referring to people outside the faith. So he says, now I say this and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do. We could say no longer walk as unbelievers do. No longer walk as non-Christians do. The problem with using the term non-Christian is that the word Christian has got a really bad connotation. Anybody know what I mean? When you hear the word Christian, what do you? What, what's the first word that pops into your mind when you hear Christian? Televangelist. Televangelist, what'd you say? Brody. Hypocrite. Hypocrite. Christ-like. Hypocrite. Snob. Yeah, let's be real. Besides televangelist, snob, hypocrite. Religious. Religious. Party. A finger pointer people. Yeah, the finger pointing people. A follower instead of leader. Yeah. Yeah. Illuminati. <laughs> Angel. Oh, Angel. Yes, he did. Because here's what's happened over time. Right? True that. 2,000 years ago, when Christians were actually, the first Christians were called followers of the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Any man that comes to the Father is going to come through him, and they're going to follow him. And it, from that statement, they, the original Christians, were called followers of the way. And then the term came along, Christian, which means Christian, which is Christ in me. Little Christ running around. And in the first century church, over 2,000 years ago, you had people that were so sold out to Jesus, they were willing to die. One of my sheroes in the faith is... Um, Perpetua is her name. If you ever want to read about somebody really cool, his, history-wise, uh, Perpetua and her handmaiden, Felicity. She was willing to go into the Colosseum where they were torturing Christians and be fed to a female lion and a female bear. She was a female. She had just had a baby. She was still nursing her baby. She was willing to leave her baby for the cross of cause of Christ. And her father begged and begged and begged and begged her, please, denounce Christ, denounce this business that you've got yourself involved in, come back to our family religion so that you can raise your son. And she said, I can't do that. And there's actually a journal and writings of what she experienced and, and the process that she went through in being a very early leader in the church of being willing to lay down your life for the cause of Christ. And um, it's really far out. It's a far out thing to read and just to understand that the attitude and devotion that she had to Jesus Christ and following him was so strong and so deep within her that she was willing to throw everything in her life away to not renounce her belief in Christ. Now here's the thing. Everybody in Texas, we're in the we're the belt buckle of the Bible belt. This area is, okay? And so we are, um, everybody is Christian. You can ask anybody and everybody, and everybody's going to tell you, yes, they're Christian. Now, you go up north, go to New York, or go to Oregon, nope. and not so much. Wow. Not so much at all. But here, head. we are the buckle of the Bible belt. And so, it can be very confusing. Very confusing. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Here's the funny part. If you look up all the, you know, where they do census, but like, you have to uh, check that little yeah. box. Yeah. Well, they go, there's a website that you actually go to and go look up all the census in the state of Texas. We call ourselves Christians in the Bible Belt, but yet we have the highest uh, drug deal. We have the highest prostitute. The highest, highest rate of abortion. We have highest sin, basically. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you're bringing up exactly you're, you're bringing up exactly where I was going with that because just because you call yourself Christian doesn't mean that you are. Yes, ma'am. Um, I understand what you're saying, but like from me being on the East Coast, where I'm from, 
Virginia, where I'm from, I, I like Texas because they allow that you to be able to have, like, sometimes they be having over there downtown at that park where they have their prayer, like, one day they pray. Yeah. We don't we don't see that out there. Right. So I can honestly say that that's a good thing that y'all do have. Right. right. We're a little bit, there's, I mean, there's not a whole lot of folks that just sit outside and do Jesus outside. So, yeah. and, and we get, we have the freedom still now to still do that. Um, and so a there's, sin is a sin. there's bold, there's boldness in Texas. I will yeah. say that everything's bigger in Texas. They say, Oh yeah. I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, I don't know. These water folks have been coming into my house lately. Sure they are probably the biggest ones I've ever Big enough to ride. That is, that is true because they do got both like, Sometimes me and him be downtown Sunday Square, and there are people out there on the little thing be testifying about God, and the police be trying to run them off, but they both because they sit there and say, we're going to do what God wants us to do regardless right. of like it or not. Yeah. They're still exactly. standing. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, I, I admire folks like that, and I don't have a problem standing out doing something like that, but there are people that stand out and do that to give the rest of us a bad name. Because right. many years right. ago... Um, when we were still, when I was still over the singles group in the church before we started this church here, we had come downtown for something, and I was, we parked in the parking garage, and I was coming out the door, and it was over by that thing with the angels on it, the bass hall. And as we came down, there were some folks standing out there preaching, and they told me that I was going to hell. <laughs> well, they didn't even ask me if I believed. They didn't ask me of my opinion. They didn't ask me of my history. They didn't ask me of of what I knew about it. They just flat out told me I was going to hell. Now, they assumed I was going to hell because of the way I look. Because I got pink hair yeah, and tattoos. They so they judged me. The book by they judged yeah. the book by its cover. Yeah. So going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Just because you go to church doesn't mean that you have the fortitude and the belief system within you that's going to carry you the whole way through. We um we had when we were starting our church and we had a building and we had children's ministry and a, and a youth group and we were interviewing for children's pastors and he said what is it that you want a children's pastor to do I said here's what I want I want you to be able to teach the kids enough about Jesus that's going to open their minds to them to to the kids and to draw them in so that their faith is so much. That in their lifetime, because it's probably going to happen in their lifetime, that when Christianity is illegal and they put a gun to their mama or their daddy's head and say, renounce Christ or I'm going to kill your mama and daddy, that they love Jesus enough to say, I can't do that. Now that happens all over the world now. It doesn't happen here in, in the United States, but it happens all over the world. Um, I was listening to a favorite pastor of mine who was telling a story about a young lady that was in a service of his, and it was a healing service, and she fell out, and, and she was struggling with some demons, and, but here was her backstory. She, when she was six years old, she lived on the other side of the world where Jesus is illegal, and she was walking her dog, and she heard some screaming. She went running back with her dog, hit, hid in the bushes, held her dog's mouth closed so he wouldn't make any noise while she watched the whatever those folks are with guns and jungles, gorillas, gorilla, gorilla, gorilla warfare people, yeah. slaughter her mom and her father and her 11 oh, siblings, wow, wow. and then hang them up in the front of the city so the city would be aware that following Jesus was not okay. So six years old, she carried that all the way into, she was in her 20s now, and then after this, after this service was over and whatnot, he got a chance to meet with her, and she said that what she realized that day, sitting in that service, is that 11 children didn't die that day. 12 did, because she died inside. Wow. But Christ had made her come alive and realized they didn't have anything to do with her, and that those, her, her siblings and her parents, are waiting for her in heaven. Oh, yeah. So how we see things with our eyes is different than how they really are. And while we do the needs list, oh, wow, it is monsooning outside. We made a good call, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and did you roll up all four of the windows? Good job. Um, the, um, while we love the junk in the trunk and the meal and the needs list and all of that, our, my focus 
is that I can present to you an understanding of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, so that you have an opportunity to make a rational choice on your own. Now, you have the freedom to deny Christ. That's, that's what you can choose to do. We are created with free will. He did give us that choice. Now, why you would want to do that, I can't understand. I don't either. I can't understand it at all because yeah, here's where I was going with all of this because I know who I used to be before Jesus. Even though I was not the bad kid on the block and I was not, you know, I never skipped school and I just, I mean, I made A's and B's and, and all that kind of stuff. Now, my life fell apart after that. And addiction took hold of my life. But when I was growing up, I was an okay kid. I mean, my mom didn't like me, but that's near dirty. <coughs> and, and, and so... I, I thought I was okay until I understood by studying and reading this that I'm born of sin into sin and until I get born again I'm stuck with that old life of sin even if I'm okay even if I'm not breaking any rules for the day I can I can talk Christianese I cannot cuss I cannot smoke not drink not go to the wrong places and still be very lost that's not going to get me an eternity anywhere. So Paul writes this. Now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. You know where life falls apart first? In the mind. In your mind. Your mind will direct your heart. Your heart will, will lead you places you shouldn't go. And, and it's the mind, which is why Paul writes in Romans that we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our life's going to change when we get rid of our stinking thinking. So they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance that's in them due to their hardness of heart. That's a lot if you listen to it. Darkened in their understanding. That's deep. Alienated from the life of God. That's lonely. Because of ignorance, that's kind of just stupid. Um, due to the hardness of heart. The longer you run, the farther you go, the harder your heart becomes and the harder it is to come back. I had a good friend, good friend. He came to our halfway house. He had no place to go. And um, we picked him up at the Texaco over here by Avalon many years ago and he didn't want Jesus he just didn't want he didn't want to be at Avalon anymore and he didn't want to be on the streets but he didn't want Jesus but he thought Jesus was cool he just didn't want a life that he would have to surrender his own life to yeah. and very quickly he got a job and things looked like they were going well and not far enough into the program he said I can do this on my own and he left and it wasn't long until he was running them up. Back in the dope gang, back in the running drugs and guns and stealing cars and just really <coughs> making a bad choice. And demons were after him, serious. Like so serious that he could see them and talk to them and, and um, it wasn't just a trip, it was for real. It was a gift that he had, the ability yeah. to see the unseen world. And um, so I talked to him one day and I said, I will preach your funeral because that's where this is going. Mm -hmm. J uh, James 1 tells us that all sin, when it's full grown, leads to death. And I said, God gives an offer to each of us, okay? I, I'm on the, God's on this side of the table, we are on this side, and God sends an offer over here to us. The offer of grace and mercy and salvation, um, a condemnation-free life, a, a life of freedom. And, and the harder our heart gets, the more that that offer is moved away. And while that offer is still on the table, it's very close to God by the time our sin, which is just bad habits, turns into um, transgressions, which is willful sin against God, which turns into iniquity, which is where we tell God, up yours. And in that place of iniquity, the offer is still on the table, but it's way over here. And the ability to reach it and to come to it is no near impossible. Rules. Not impossible, <clears throat> but near impossible. And I said, I'm just fearful 
that you're not going to take this offer while it's still on your side of the table. Now, here's what he did. He broke into the job that he got fired from, um, stole a car, had a whole bunch of drugs on him, went across county line, ate all the drugs so that he wouldn't catch that charge, died in the back seat of the car, brought back to life, died two more times on the way to the hospital, was in the hospital trying to recover from all that he had. So he's got a, a B and E, he's got an auto theft, he's got a grand larceny, and he had um, when it was all said and done, after he cut the handcuffs off the bed and tried to escape from the hospital and got tased, mm -hmm. he caught an escape charge, and I don't know, he had a list. Okay, well, and we all know the three strike rule, right? This was his, gonna be his third felony. <clears throat> and they were gonna double enhance his charges. And, um, and he had charges in Johnson and Tarrant County. And here's where he is now. He'll be getting out this next year after serving only two years. And he is at least, if not more, knowledgeable in the word than I am. Because in Von Evans, he hit his knees after he got all the drugs out of his system after about two weeks. He paced like a tiger in there just back and forth. Um, then he realized that all that stuff I was trying to teach him was real. And he hit his knees, and he gave his life to Jesus, and he asked for one book, and for six months, Day and night, he read this. Wow. <laughs> Day and night. And he knows it at least as much as I do, if not more. And I called him my single cell preacher because he was single cell preaching from one single cell to another. Wow. And then he got transferred to a G4 unit where he has <coughs> continued in his walk living for Christ. Oh, yeah, they call him preacher now. They call him preacher. <laughs> Cool. G4 is awesome. awesome. No, a G4 is where the folks that are bad go. The folks that have life sentences, so it doesn't matter if they kill anybody because they're not ever going to get out. That kind of thing. All of those charges he should have got live for. He got five years and he's getting out this next year. Five years, both counties. Wow. He didn't snitch on nobody. He surrendered his life to Jesus. And you don't got to snitch when God's on your side. No, you and sure don't. Years, Come on. Because favor is way better than snitching. Uh, sounds impossible, yeah. don't it? It does sound impossible. I got a, I got a testimony to go with that. Tell me. I could have been, do been doing anything. a life sentence at the age of 14 years old. I could have went there 20 years of my life in juvenile TYC. And could have went to TDC after I got out. But... The Lord dropped a first degree felony from attempted murder to an aggravated assault. There you go. So stop not living your life for him, Samuel. I'm serious. That's an amazing testimony. But what happens when God shows us favor and then we poo poo on him? Uh, he don't like that. He don't like that. Now, it doesn't stop his love for us, which is what that grace and mercy is about. It doesn't stop his love for us. But why on earth would we do that? Yes, ma'am. I never stop loving him, but a lot of times, like sometimes, I wish God could show, like, show how he really feels. Because I was only being 31 years old all my life that sometimes we take God for granted. Yeah. You know, like the prayers that I've been praying when I was young in my 20s, it's asking him for what I want. Right. Yeah. It's not really asking him for what I need. And what I need is his love, his mercy. His salvation, his will in your his life, will, his yeah. guidance. Right. Because living in this world right now, Straight you are distracted by anything that be around you. Right. And sometimes you need to humble yourself <coughs> according to His word. Don't sit here and pretend that everything is all right. Because deep down inside, God knows how to convict your heart. Yeah. He knows how to get you down. Like when you in that jail cell, when your mama sit there and say, "I'm not gonna collect any more phone calls from right. you," and you ain't got no friends coming to see you and visit you, and there ain't nobody putting money on your books. Who you Hello. call on? You right. need to ask God to have mercy right. on you. Right. So right. God can. That's one thing he shows up say. always too. And he's always yeah. on time. Yeah. God yeah. always yeah. answers. But may not be the answer you want, but God always answers. Do yeah. yeah. what? The friends you think are your friends. Are oh, gone. they're not your they, friends. They're gonna run away. They will hightail it the minute the lights get turned on. I'm yep. saying. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. um, bunch of cockroaches. Yep. Yeah. All right. Like rats living. We're talking about due to the hardness of their heart. <clears throat> Verse 19 says, They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. 
But that is not the way you learned in Christ. I don't want you just to see, want to hear. I don't want you just to hear the things that I say. I want you to see evidence of Christ in my life. Put me to the test. Amen. Somebody, a few weeks ago, I was over at the annex, and I was telling one person, I'm going to love you forever. There is nothing you can do that's going to make me not love you. And this guy over here said, oh, yeah, because I tried. I put her to the test. I really thought she wouldn't love me, and she still loves me. Yes. Because God loves. And if we're Christian, <coughs> Christ in us, then we've got to look just like Christ did and Christ loved to the point of giving his life up for Amen. you. For me, at all costs. Amen. He didn't die on the cross for us. He died on the cross as us. Yeah. He felt our sin and our diseases and the things that we brought on us in our life as he hung there and was separated from the Father for the first time ever because he loved us. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I didn't have to get clean to come to Jesus. Jesus died on the cross so that I could come to him however nasty and dirty yeah. I am. Yeah. Amen. Period. Amen. We have a saying, we catch him, he cleans him. I don't care where you've been, what you've done. I'm going to share Jesus with you and it's the Holy Spirit's job to fix your life. Yeah. I'm not here to fix your life. I'm here to love you. I'm here to love you unconditionally, no matter what. Sometimes that concludes tough love. Because I'll tell you straight. That's the best love. That it is, is the best, best love. love. Not everybody thinks best. that, but it I is. It is the best love. That's really. the best love. But I'll always be here with the love of Christ. No matter what. Because Jesus took me and saved me from me and made me who I am today. And I'm not who I was because I am dead to that person. And I am alive in Christ. Mm -hmm. I've been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2. Yeah. I've been crucified with Christ. But I still live. But it's not me that lives, but Christ that lives in me. Period. And if it weren't for Christ living in me, I would be dead. Darren and I joke about it. If we'd known we were going to live this long, we'd have taken better care of ourselves. <laughs> you know? We thought we'd be way out of here by at least 40, and so we didn't have to take care of ourselves. But I'm here to tell you, 50 rolls around, and then what? <clears throat> It is a <laughs> All right. So Paul writes, but that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is Jesus. Here's what we do. Here's how your life changed. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of the minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Put off your old self. It breaks my heart when I hear stuff about folks falling out and making bad choices and, and self-destructing. That's really what it is. Self-destructive reports that I see or experience or hear about for our family makes me weep all night long. Because life is so better when we put off our old self and become alive in Christ. That means when we put off our old self and you're thinking, well, I did that. I was, you know, in the one, at church camp or when I was in my 30s, some preacher said, if I don't accept Jesus, I'm going to burn and die and go to hell. So I said, that's not what that means. Jesus didn't say go into all the world and make professing Christians. He said go into all the world and make disciples, which is students of the teacher who look like the teacher, who walk and act like the high teacher, which is Jesus. And we look like Jesus in every aspect and at every turn and in every situation, every temptation, every fork in the road, every crisis. You can't have a crisis come into your life and then go, wait a minute, what would Jesus do? No, you're already Jesus, so that when the crisis comes, you're already like Jesus, not Jesus. That would be weird. You're like Jesus. Yeah. Unless your name is Jesus, then you kind of get off. Right. But anyway, you're like Jesus, so when the crisis comes, you just react automatically. Some of you have been around a while. Remember the mm -hmm. bug I used to have? And, I remember. And um, anyway, I got rear-ended. And because our house is right off of a busy road. Wasn't it a green bug? And, uh, it was gray. And it had gray bug, hippie flowers, flowers all over it. <laughs> and a big Jesus yeah, fish on the back. Bug. And then I got another gray one that didn't have the hippie flowers on it yet because Darren said he wouldn't drive it with the hippie flowers on it. <laughs> and he was having to drive it to work. Oh, and so I was holding off with the hippie flowers 
But anyway, so I got rear-ended. And what had happened was some guy that was mowing the ditch in front of our house mowed off into the ditch and then fell over on its side. So it was kind of like, wow, first day mowing much, you know, kind of thing. And um, and so she was looking at that and ran right smack dab in the back of me. Well, it totaled the bug because they're plastic. And, and so she was devastated. She was 18. I get out of the car, and, it, and it, I'd already had my wheel turned, so when she hit me, it pushed me into my driveway. So I get out, and, and I go running over to her, and I ask her, are you okay? Are, are you all right? Do, I, do we need to call an ambulance or whatever? This lady came running over here, and she was like, you need to sit down. I saw the whole thing. I know you're hurt. I said, girl, I'm not hurt. I need to, I need to, I need to talk to this lady because she's upset. And she was like, I'm gonna be in so much trouble. I said, don't worry about the car. Are you okay? Now I could have got out and go, what are you doing? You're ruining my car. I was gonna put Jesus stickers on it and flowers <laughs> right. going, there we are, and all of this, and yada yada. <laughs> but would that look like Jesus? Nope. No. Not at all. I prayed with her. Hmm? What would I said, Jesus it's do? It's gonna be okay. Yeah. Pray with her. And so, you know, then her daddy came and it was her mama's car. And so but it was all good. It was all good. It doesn't matter what it is, it's stuff. It's just stuff, and all stuff is gonna go away, except for eternity. This junk in the trunk, it's gonna be gone by next week. Your needs list, somebody's, you're either gonna lose it, you're gonna wear it out, or somebody's gonna steal it, right? I mean, that's just the way it rolls. All of everything, even the stuff that I have, is all gonna go away. And I got, I got socks older than most of you people in this room. Discipling is a lost art. It is a lost yes, it art. Is. It doesn't happen anymore. No, it's, it's Plato, about... Plato's life was so um, emblematic and was so uh, worthy, D, by others that... Um, I mean, Socrates was so intense that he had a student named Plato that learned mm-hmm. to hold his fork like him. He watched him when he sneezed. Mm-hmm. He, and he watched how he did that. He watched wow. which foot he always started with. He watched how he rubbed his eye. He, he watched but, everything about it. And so he learned he to imitate him. Do, he became right. a little Socrates. The yeah. disciples in Jesus, they learned They learned how he scratched his ear. They learned things that he said. They they were little Jesus running around. Right. They, right. They, if you've seen him, you've seen him. Right. And this was, this was a deal in times past. But not so much today because... There has been a loss of importance of walking. We're called to be holy. I mean, <clears throat> if you just want to like some serious butt spank and just read Ephesians, we're called to not use filthy language. We're called to not tell bad jokes. We're called to not make fun of others. We're called to walk holy. We're called to be just like Jesus. That's what being a Christian is. So here's how we're gonna here's how we're gonna change. Put off your old self, which belongs to the former na- manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. To be renewed in the spirit of your mind, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Because what happens is Jesus came to restore to us our identity, which is from comes from being born again. Being born again is the saying a prayer to escape hell. Being born again is a new, a brand new life. We're refathered. We have a new life. Everything about us is new because all of the old is gone and dead. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. Um, I thank you that we have a building to go into when it starts to monsoon outside. Thank you that you uh, provide for us in just unimaginable ways. That you have a message for us all throughout the week, Holy Spirit, that you will speak to us. And light us on fire so that our light shines bright so that we're not basket-headed Christians with a a Christian with a basket over our head so that we're not bright to a dark and dying world around us. Help us to bring hope to others and to love like you do. Thank you for your grace and mercy, your forgiveness, your unconditional love, sobriety, our food that you give us, our junk in the trunk, our needs list stuff, and our family that we have here. You are a good father to us, and we praise you and thank you. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.